This episode of the Luke Brain Quino Show is brought to you by Logan Coach. I had a guy tell me one time, man, marijuana will slow you down and make you uh, uh, indecisive and temperamental and you'll sleep all the time or eat too much and you don't need to eat anyway, you'll be too fat. He said, he said but, it, but if you're in a bind, anytime, cocaine and pills will carry you on and make you go fat. <laughs> and, and it did for a long ass time. Hey, hit that subscribe button now. You're going to like it. Welcome to the Luke Branquino Show. My next guest does not need an introduction. He's a good friend, and he is the 2000 Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame inductee. Joe Beaver, thanks for joining me, man. Thanks, Luke. Good to talk to you, old boy. For, for guys like us that I feel like we're knowledgeable of, obviously very knowledgeable of the sport, whether it's travel, um, how to you know, financially get through it, and obviously in the arena, to be able to still be involved and help the younger generations, but to me more so help the public kind of understand what rodeo athletes have to go through and what their lifestyles are like. I think it's it's so awesome to be able to express that now since we're not in the arena. That's the biggest thing and I always try to do. Um, my dad told me one time when I first started doing TV and I did my first TV with Jeff and Butch in 99. I did the Cow Palace when I was hurt that year. But late, a couple later, you know, a year or two later on, he said, listen, you, as in you and I, we know what we're watching. But if we can't explain to the people what they're seeing, where they enjoy it, we'll never sell it to them as a sport. Right. And, and I think that's what always carried over to me is I've tried to make it to where, man, I want them to be able to enjoy and see what I'm watching. And, and, and it, it, I want to sell it to them as a package, as an athlete, as an individual sport, and as a lifestyle. And, and I think that's what we try to do every day. Oh, for sure. For sure we do it. And I think we have to because we need, and I guess it's getting better with TV, you know, the Cowboy Channel, and you have C, uh, WCRA putting stuff on CBS Sports and the American you know, we need to we need to keep pushing it out there, especially now. Take advantage of this Yellowstone kick, where everybody's into the Western culture. But they need to be into they, when they watch it. They need to understand it and learn to love it, like we do. And it starts with you know junior high rodeo or That's whatever. It. You know, I mean junior high. Talk to the kids, get them. You know, it's a serious deal now. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I don't know about maybe it changed by the time you come along, but you know we had a season that we went. You know what I mean? Other than that, we played sports. They go year round now. I mean, some association in Texas has got rodeos every week for the kids. You know, and, and I'm telling you, man, that's a different that's a different gig. That's a hard lifestyle right there. They're they're 24/7 almost 10 months a year now. So, I think it starts with uh, those guys and girls, the young ones, bringing them up that way that we know we'd like them to be later. To where they enjoy their lifestyle, they live their lifestyle, but other people that they go along the meet along the way can also ride with the tail, you know? Congratulations to the Pro Roadie Hall of Fame class of 2023. Thank you. Logan Coach Trailers would like to congratulate Luke on his recent induction into the Hall of Fame. We are proud to have partnered with Luke for over a decade. Luke has been a first-class endorsee in every sense. There is no one that is more deserving of such a great honor. Luke has always showed great humility, class, and professionalism as we have worked together. Having Luke and the Logan Coach team has been very enjoyable, and he has definitely helped continue to improve the product. Congratulations to Luke and his family. Yeah, and we see that with the junior NFR at, at Vegas. And now there's some mixed feelings about that, and I don't know your thoughts on it, but a lot of people, not a lot, a few people have said, I think that's bullshit to have the junior NFR. That's for the pro Cowboys. That's their time to shine. And then you bring in the junior stuff, and it kind of waters it down a little bit. I think it's great. Don't get me wrong. I think it's great. Um, I, I've taken Kobe out there, you know, Kobe, Jonathan brother. I think it's, it's a great. But I'm also – you know, Vegas is Vegas. It's It would be like having Pop Warner games around the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? 
Super Bowl is a Super Bowl for those guys that have given their life to get there. They, right. they, and everybody goes to watch it. You know what I'm saying? So it's a little, I'm a little pulled in both directions. Um, I think it's a great deal for the kids. Uh, I, I, I love the fact they can go in, you know, good money and they can be there and, and take in the Vegas, you know, feel and all that. But I don't know if it doesn't maybe take away a little bit of that, get my permit, get my car, be successful, make the finals in gold. If that, if that doesn't, I don't want it to sound like I'm kicking the junior stuff around, but I, I think it, it, and I do junior opens and I, I, they call me about doing some junior stuff out there. You know, one time I just, I kind of, I, I guess I'm old school on showcasing the top 15 because I know what it takes to get there. Yeah. And that makes, that makes a hundred. I mean, that makes all the sense in the world. And, and it's almost like you're given, maybe not, maybe you're given some of those kids you know, like, okay, this is how Vegas is. Well, no, this is not how Vegas is. This is not the national finals. It takes way more <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears, and miles, and time away from home, time away from your family to get here. That's the part I'm talking about right there. I, that's the part I think needs to stay NFR, top 15, Vegas. When you fly into Vegas, you fly in there to drink, gamble, eat, and watch them compete and shop. You know what I mean? The the I, and and here's in my deal. Okay, if you're gonna have the finals, the, all the junior stuff like that, let's have it like a final. Let's have a perf. Let's have a rodeo perf. You know, let's have five yeah. perfs or something. They're jackpot now. There's all they're doing. Yeah, it's jackpots in Vegas. That Vegas is not a jackpot. It's a nightly competition, rodeo. It's a ten at average, one night at a time to get it. So I just you know I I, I don't know. I think it's really good. And I'm I'm, you know I think it's great. But the other part of me says it's not Vegas like they think. Logan Coach offers the strongest, safest structural frame in the trailer industry. All Logan Coach trailers have a sleek, sexy aluminum body with a Galva Strong subframe. This gives you a stronger, safer trailer that looks and pulls great and will outlast any trailer going down the road. Logan Coach trailers are truly built to last. If you haven't seen a Logan Coach lately, you owe it to yourself to check out the latest Logan Coach has to offer. Visit one of our local dealers or check us out online at www.logancoach.com. Not old school. Speaking of old school, the difference now, which we talked about with the junior NFR, I can remember hearing stories in 85, which that was the first year to the finals, winning mm -hmm. the world. Uh, and they dubbed the house that Joe built, obviously, the Thomas yeah. and Mac for a lot of people. And I I was honestly surprised that when they did the icons of rodeo, you weren't one of the first ones in that building because it was the house that Joe built. And I know that that these awards, you know, whatever, it's not something that you're you're caught up in, but man, and nothing against the people they, they put in. No, 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 no. The greatest of the great. I'm not even the second. Uh, that's what I was gonna say. About? You know, I mean, hell, I, I, they've used me to advertise that sucker for 25, 35, 35 years. Yeah, yeah. But it, what, yeah, whatever. I'm like, you, great people went in. Don't yes. get me wrong, the greatest of the great. But yeah, I was a little bit like this year. I was like, well, I, yeah, I can see that, but maybe next year. But whatever. But yeah, when we went there that first year, nobody was for it. Me, I was all for it. it the rounds paid seventy five hundred or some. 85, I don't remember what it was, but it was more money than I'd ever wrote for, you know what I mean, in one night at a rodeo. And and they, I would just happen to be one of the first guys they interviewed about it. Um, and I remember standing out there and they, back then the school wasn't built all around it. You know, there was just a little bit of school back on the yeah. very back side, way back there. And I was standing out there by the parking lot and this reporter asked me, you know, he said, well, how do you think that Las Vegas is going to be able to handle the national finals in the little Thomas and Mac? And I hadn't even been in there yet. And I was like, man, I don't know. I've never been in the finals. It's my first one. And he was like, this is your first one and his first time in Vegas? I said, yeah. And he said, well, what do you think about – What do you, you're, you're a roper, right? I said, yeah, what do you think about roping in the small area? I said, listen, mister, for 70-whatever hundred, well, I said, I'd rope in this parking lot. I think it's great <laughs> to be in Vegas, you know? I, and so they just kind of – Vegas and I kind of built our name the first year right there together. And, and, and you know, w so different than it is now, you know? You couldn't go, you say Joe's at Caesars, you know, Joe's Crab Check of Miami and stuff, the big nice places, or pick another nice place, Del Frisco's, or wherever you want to talk about. You couldn't eat there. They were closed. 
that was their um, uh, vacation time. Yeah. There were yeah. no big shows. There was no big entertainers. They were actually no kid and loop. I think in '86 they were recarpeting the hallways at Stardust when we stayed there because that was the time they repainted and fixed stuff. You know, it was it was not an important time. And and the Thomas and Mac and me and a few other colorful characters, <laughs> we brought rodeo to Vegas at the right time. Well, you did, and, and Vegas was the fitting, you know. And obviously, we see it now, 35 years, however many years later. Yeah why it is what it is where it is and and the success it's had and you know we i'm gonna i'm gonna bring up some stories that we have talked about that you said we were okay to talk about but uh you know there's a party town there's plenty of plenty of whatever you needed whether it was cocaine or whatever you needed hey, it's hey, they always said women, women wine and wonders women wine and wonders were a phone call away <laughs> and that was a fact i mean hey rick and the red streaks for years played and nobody, we all went to Ricky and the Red Streaks and they didn't get to the three or four o'clock in the morning. And then for years, everywhere everybody went, then we went to the beach and oh, the yeah. beach didn't turn loose till daylight, 6.30 or seven o'clock in the morning. You know, I mean, it was just a total different, it was, it was a total different vibe in town. Now, I, it's still that way, I'm sure everywhere you can find, you can go find it, but it used to find you in that town, you know, uh, fun found the fun lookers very yeah. easily back then, you know? Friends, whatever trailer parts you need, brakes, axles, wiring, go to Husky Trailer and Parts Company. Visit them at huskytrailerstx.com slash Luke. All the top brands and thousands of parts are in stock and ready to ship. The best part is shipping is always free anywhere in the lower 48. Husky has been in the business for more than 60 years. I rely on Husky for my trailer park needs. Husky, generations of trust delivered. Well, and you've told me stories that when you first started and going uh, with your card, somebody told you, do not ever touch marijuana. Yeah, I had a guy tell me one time, man, marijuana will slow you down and make you uh, uh, indecisive and temperamental and you'll sleep all the time or eat too much and you don't need to eat anyway you'll be too fat he said he said buddy but if you're in a bind anytime cocaine and pills will carry you on and make you go fast <laughs> and, and it did for a long ass time i was gonna say you used that motto for a long time didn't I you live by that motto for a long time until it just shut you down well now what he didn't tell me was he failed to mention that I have yet to see anybody overdose on marijuana and fall out <laughs> in an airport, but you can do that on cocaine. <laughs> well, and, and you've told me you was it I don't, was it El Paso Airport? El Paso, yeah, El Paso. I fell out, man, in the terminal. I'd been. I tell you, I'll back up. I had been clean for about. I have a dear friend of mine, and he lives out there in California, uh, uh, Lee Ferris, and he has golf courses. And I went out there to stay with Lee in the summer of 90, 90. Oh, for the, no, for the spring, for the rodeos. And man, I, I was spun out of control and life was shit. Um, I, drugs had went the other way. They didn't help me anymore. Or they never probably did. But I mean, they had just turned on me, you know. They were, they were like the knife. It was just a butter knife one side and a butcher knife on the other. And it was a butcher knife then. So my life was gone to shit. I wasn't winning. I hurt stuff, you know. Anyway, I go out there and stay leave fair. It's all spring and all spring. Get cleaned up. Get off the shit. Start practicing out there. He had a hill to his house down the golf course. Got myself back in shape. Felt good. Went that summer. Went that winter of ninety. That had been like ninety. I hurt my knee at Angelo that fall in November. And I had, man, Jenna was big and pregnant. Brody was on the way. I'd hurt my knee at the match or open, so I didn't win the match. The finals are four weeks away. I have surgery, and the first thing they do is give you the pain pills, you know? Yeah. Man, I get on the pain pills. I start rehabbing my knee, and it wasn't nothing but orthoscopic, but it was pretty three holes. I had to go in different, you know? And I started lifting weights and tying in two weeks. You know, it was not ready. I mean, it was not. I'm sorry. It was just, and just, I thought, man, I know I got better shit than pain pills, you know. 
and I had been off of it since about April. And man, I got back on it that through the through the winter, through the finals to get the I was on it through the finals. You know, Brody's this long, a little baby, born November twentieth. You know, my life just total shit. And I stay on it all winter and all through the buildings, you know, because my knee is never, I've never let it heal. I went right to, you know how it used to be, go to the finals to Odessa, you know, yeah. in two or three weeks. I went from Odessa to Denver to Scottsdale, you know, to all the, and back, and I wound up, by the time I get to El Paso, man, my knee's as big as my head, and it's not healing up, and I need to let it heal, and I'm just, just living on that shit, and I damn sure hit the point and, and like my my doctor said, you know, once your system is kind of clean of all that, and then you just flood it, it can only take so much. And it shut me down. February the, either the 3rd or the 6th, 91, I fell out in the El Paso airport dead as a doornail, man. Um, and it, I tell you what it does. It, it gives you, it gives you a light, a bright light of either I'm doomed or I got to fix it. You know, um, I can still remember this day when I, they, I come to, they're asking me, they, if, if they ever ask you your mother's maiden name, what town you're in, your social security number, and who is the president, and you can't answer all that, you in a bind. <laughs> because oh, that's the first questions they fired off to me, the paramedics. And I was like, damn, and I was answering everything, you know. But the the best thing ever happened to me is when I when I fell out, dead. they used to have pay phones on like a long row. Of, they were sit down. You could sit down and use them, you know. And they were just, you know, they were, I don't know, belt tie probably. Well, when I fell out, I hit that on the way down and dislocated my right shoulder. So my right shoulder's down by my ribs. And they got to pop it back in, you know. And I remember being in the hospital. They take me to the hospital. And it hurts. It's down there. And they got towels right there. And they wanted to give me something. And that doctor, I remember this doctor to this day looking at me. And he said, I think you got plenty of pain medicine in you, don't you? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Go ahead. You know, because he didn't want to add to it, you know, because right. he knew I was way over the tox limit you know so they just strapped sheets around it and pulled it and it inched it back up until it pow it popped back in well when it did it was you know i had to tie it to my side so they tied my shoulder the only thing that i had of any value at that time because i'd spent a lot of money man i'd blowed a lot of money partying and stupid shit anyway I, all i had luke that was anything worth a dime was my arm to rope with right well, now they've got that thing tied to my side. I've got a baby that's a month, two, three months old. And I've got a wife to take care of. And I have got zero look, uh, uh, bright spot to look at. You know what I mean? And also to throw on top of that, that was the first year we had David's memorial rope. And David Bowen, my yep. shit like my brother, that died in a plane crash in 1990. Uh, going from St. Paul to Pinoca at hit Mount Rainier with uh, Randy Dearlum and Dave Smith, Ron Curran, or uh, David, uh, David Curran. So anyway, I didn't have nothing going, you know, nothing for me. So I'm tied to my side, and that's the best thing ever happened to me because it took about, I think it took two months. I know I missed all February, all of March because I went back to Lee Ferris again, my dear friend. I drove, loaded up and drove out there to California for the spring rodeos. That's the first time I got to rope. And I flew back and roped the match at Ryan's because I was so broke. You know, it paid 5000 back then, and I just rehabbed my shoulder. But when my shoulder, when I was down, that's when I got a hold of it and said, you know what, you did this, you better figure out how to get out of this. Because I wouldn't go to rehab because, to me, that was a crutch. Then if I, re, if I went back to my old way, who am I going to blame it on? Well, they didn't do a good job. They didn't get me, you know, right. So I told myself, um, I, I met with a guy named Ronnie Wilkinson. He, he was a good friend of uh, of ours, a friend of mine, and he was a counselor. And he said, you can't do this on your own. You got to go somewhere. I said, no, I did it on my own, so I got to get off of it on my own, you know. And he put a $100 bill on the table. He said, you got any $100? I said, probably not. I'm broke. He said, put $100. So I got my left hand, tried to dig it out of my pocket, left hand, I put $100 down. He said, in one year, That'll be mine because you'll be right back where you are. Unless, and I've told you this before too, I said, Brody literally saved my life and 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 almost killed me later on. You know what I mean? And he said, you go home and you pick that baby boy up and you look in his eyes and if you don't quit, I can't help you, rehab can't help you. Right. And, and that's what did it. That's what got me. You know, and it took a year 
to be honest, it took all of 91 to get my shit back right, you know, and then I come back and won it in 92 and three and I think was second 94, you know, but it, but it, it took not being able, my first exercises, and I tell people this, they think I'm crazy. When they turn my arm loose, it just, because it was so tore up where, you know, they didn't want it popping out again, was, was sliding pairs of socks yeah. on a tabletop. Sli- you know what I mean? Sliding oh, yeah. from pile to pile. You probably went through your stuff this, and I could yeah. not hardly do it. You know, so that said everything to me to say, okay, God's blessed me with an unbelievable talent with this arm that he just took away from me and said, without that, you ain't shit, partner, unless you'd straighten your stuff up. And, you know, that was 19, or that was 1991, February 6th. You know, and I never hit none since. Well, and, and I remember you saying while you were laying dead, I mean, really in the airport, you had a vision. Was it David that you think was because you could see the body, but you couldn't see the thing? It wasn't even, I mean, it was like me and you were talking right now. I'm telling and I was dead a long time, Luke. I was deprived, you know, they say when you're completely dead and no brain oxygen, your brain all this bull for so many minutes, you're in a bind, you know, you shouldn't come back like I did. And, and I did and I thought it was for, I really thought that I came back and got another chance for all the good I was gonna do, but I'd already done, I'd already won plenty. I already had a couple of championships, you know, and I had, uh, I think I already had a gold medal from the Olympics. I mean, I'd already won plenty. It was to come back and to deal, deal with all the stuff that was gonna be around me and my family that that I had to help people get through. That's mm-hmm. why I came back. The other winning was just a bonus. But when I when I died, the next thing I know is David Bowen, and, and last time I'd seen him was St. Paul. They were going to get on there, and he was really, I felt bad about it for a long time, I'm not gonna lie. Um, because he come to me that morning, David actually lived with me. Um, I, I had to come home and clean his room out. Uh, he lived with me. I mean, we were that tight. And Randy was rodeoing with him. Anyway, that morning he said, man, we're not going to make it back to Noka, I don't think. We got a flight, leaves Portland and goes to Calgary, and we got to get, get a car. We're barely going to, you know, and I'm like, man, you don't miss Pinoca. So a little bit later he rides by and he says, hey, Curran's got a plane. He said, it's got two, got three, four seats on it. And think, what do you think about that? I said, you know, me back then, that's the way I rodeoed. You know, when I yeah. rodeoed with Roy in the 80s, we chartered everywhere, man. We didn't, you know, we'd go, we'd pull in the airport and find a guy with a plane and we'd fly to three that day and leave our rig, you know. So I said, well, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. I'd jump on that plane right here. And I can't remember that little town, but it's in between Molala and St. Paul. Remember that fi- that field, that airfield's right there on the oh, yeah. side yeah. of the road. That's where everybody charters in and out Belling- of, you know? Bellingham, Belling- Bellingham. Something, yeah, Bellingham. not Bellingham, but it's something, yes. Yeah. So I said, well, Y'all, y'all just, you're going to go right there and fly right into Pinocchio. That's a, man, that's a no-brainer. And he's, all right, all right, I, I think I'm going to get those seats. Well, that's the last time i seen you know, alive. So I come, I think I come too, but I'm not coming. I'm not, they're working on me. Because I look around and I can see a bunch of people around this body. And this body doesn't have a face. And it's, I'm, it's looking down. And I look and I hear this, you stupid son of a bitch. That, look what you've done. And I look over to my left and it's, Bowen's voice, you know, and, and and you don't see the facial features. You see, um, it's almost like an outline of them, like a, somebody took and in, in outlined a picture. You know what I mean? And I'm like, what? And he said, that's you, you stupid son of a bitch. And I'm like, Bowen. And he said, yeah. I said, oh, man, I'm good. I'm, I'm he said, no, no, you got to go back. And I'm like, no, no, I'm good. He said, but look at that. Look at you, you stupid. His favorite word was stupid. He called me a stupid son of a bitch 90 times a day because I did stupid things, I'm, you know, whatever. And he said, look what you've done. He said, you've got a kid, you've got a family, you've got all this, and look at you. Look what you, and I'm like, no, man, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. He said, no, you're not good. You're not good. And then I started feeling like a pull, like he was getting further away, and I'm like, hey, come here. David, come back, come back. And he's like, no, you got to go. You got to go. You're not, you can't come. You can't. I said, no, I'm good. Because I'm telling you, I was at peace, man. For the right. first time, maybe in a long time, I was at peace. And I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. He said, I'll see. He said, you got to go back. You got to go back. And it got fainter and fainter and fainter. And then I couldn't hear him anymore. I couldn't see him anymore. And they said, when I come to, they got auction and stuff. You know, I'm trying to pull that shit off, you know. And I'm like, I said, where's David? Where's David? And they're like, they're asking around, who's David? Who's David? Because they thought, you know, I want to talk to him. And it, it's just... It was it was that it was that three minutes or whatever that changed the rest of my life, 
And and, it, and when I went to counselor with Ronnie, and he told me that, and I went home and picked Brody up, and I mean, look, I fought a lot of nights, dude. Shit, I ate four trucks of Bluebell ice cream. I'm not gonna lie to you. You know, at, at 11 o'clock at night or 11:30, because that was the time I was hitting the streets running. And I'd get in Brody, I'd rock in that rocket chair and eat ice cream and think I can't hit the door. But you can't do this. You cannot hit the door. You've got to, you know. And when I finally come out of it, I, I, man, when I come out of it, I said, he saved my life right there, you know. And later on, he about killed me. But that right there is what saved me and turned me around. And that's why I've told so many kids about, you know, I've never really, I've never tried to hide it. You know what I mean? I've never right. tried to make you know i've never condoned it i mean oh, i was a mess up man i was the biggest mess up in the world i had more fun rodeoing than anybody in the world every every different way that way when it was us running wild and sex drugs rock and roll planes cars you know fast boats whatever we had it all we had fun and then i had the fun with brody when he came along with the mcdonald's playgrounds to eat lunch there with uh disneyland and we were in florida disney world we were in i mean California, Florida, yeah. you know, carnivals at the rodeo, uh, the circuses, I've done all that. And then I got to go back after a rodeo and enjoy getting to see, you know, the next generation through TV and stuff. So, man, I've had a, I've had it a good life. I've had a lot of ups and downs and I've been as low as you can be. And Luke, I promise you, I tell people all the time, you don't want to be as low as I've been twice. I've been two of the lowest spots you could ever be in, but you have to wake up each day and decide, am I going to be that way or am I going to be good as I can be for somebody or something and live there every day? And that's kind of the way I picked. Obviously, I got to I didn't get to I didn't know you at your first low point, but I and I man, it, it like it brings tears to my eyes just thinking about what you and Jenna had to go through. Yeah, you 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 know you never want to bury your 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 kids, you know, and I tell you, you got to be careful what you say, because I don't I had a kid named Brady Helens years and years ago that went with us and and um my dad taught him to rope and he stayed with us all the time he came to school in huntsville built a barn on my place kept his horse still we roped every day together he lived with us for a year and a half two years rodeo with me Bow made the finals in 90 i think that was 92 92 or 93 and he get he got killed in a in a G, in, uh, on a jeep on a county road hunting just running too fast and anyway got killed and i spoke at his funeral and I said that day, I said, man, this is the lowest point I'll ever be. This is the worst day of my life. You got to be careful what you say because ro roll forward, you know, 20 something years. And I, I hit the lowest point in my life ever. When you, when you know, when you see your own, your own body, your own son, when you lose your own kid, your own child, and you know, he's gone, I'm telling you, you can't find a lower spot to get in that day if you dug to the bottom of the earth, you know? And and like I said, when I said he saved me, Brody saved me. And I, I had a, and I had, and I went through this yesterday, you know, I got a lot of texts from a lot of good friends. Uh, my old friend, my real friend, you know, my friends that worry about you at certain times. But I did, you know, man, happy Father's Day. I know it's bad, but we wanna. And what I told him is, you know, I had 20 great years of this day. Now, the last 12, 13, 12, be 13 this year, have not been good days on that day, but I had 20 good ones, you know? So you look back at it, but I'm telling you right now, when Brody died, I almost slipped back into that other guy, 2011, and now I've got money to do what I want to do. And now I'm not rodeoing anymore. I've already retired. I'm telling you, it was, it was a frog's hair, man. It, it, that lifestyle about pulled me back because number one, you, nobody, you don't have to, you don't care about nobody. You don't have to be around anybody. You don't have to please anybody. You don't have to give two shits as long as you got drugs and whiskey and people and partying around that low crowd and them outlaws that I ran with, you know, they don't care as long as you got the, the tools, they're going to build a barn, you know? Right. And, and it was a it, it was a fight. I'm not gonna lie. It was a fight for a for a good a good week or two, you know, there that I thought, man, all I've and then it, and then you throw it back to yourself. Oh, all the good I've done and all I've done and now this wasn't about that. It's about it was about Brody. It's about Brody and choices and things that he couldn't live with. And there, you know, 
go back to my old nuns. They told me one time when I lost a good friend of mine there, they said, you know, you have a date that you're born and you have a departure date. And no matter what happens with the departure date, you're going to have to go. And it may be a good way, it may be a bad way, but for some reason, you know, that you're going to have to go because that's God's going to call you that day. And you might be two days old or 200 years old. And I think that, and I think Luke, knowing where, and because, you know, hey, we all make bad decisions at certain times, but as far as like his heart and where his faith was and how he was, you know, you can contradict, you can split the book, you can do whatever about where you go and sins, you don't go to heaven and this one, you do whatever. But I had been to where I want to say Brody is. I had sit there and talk to David. And the one thing that I don't have anymore that you do every morning when you wake up, the first thing you do in the morning, what's the first two or three things you worry about? Your kids. That's it. I don't I don't do that anymore because I, I want to know he's where I was and he's okay. But it is it easy? No. Is it is it? You know, and, and everything I do involves kids, just about, yeah. you know. I mean, yeah. I speak to a lot of kids. You know, I have all them junior opens. I do all these clinics. I get all these, you know, I had to tell myself, hey, man, this is your life, and this is how you're going to live it, and you're not going to warp it and go back to your old ways just because you've had this this hit that, that just about took, just about killed me, you know. Well, and you know, Jenna, what an angel. I mean, she has been in your whole Hey, she's got the strongest career. faith. She's got the strongest faith of anybody I've ever seen in my life. And it was tested to the to the breaking point over losing Brody. And I've never seen her waver at all. With all my stupid shit, you know, with all my ignorant stuff, with all whatever she is. And, and she fought it hard for about a year. And she come one day and she said, you know, we had him because I always said this and I tried to tell her this and I, and I said, OK, if when I he was born, I held him and God said, hey, I'm going to take him back in 20 years, February, you know, September, August 28th. I'm going to take him back. Do you still want him or you want me to take him now? I just said, no, let me have him. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I told her, I said, listen, you got to remember, is that the way you want to look at it? Or do you want to look at it the other way. But she was so she was so heartbroken you know and you know me you know as well as i do it's a deal between a boy and a mom you oh, know yeah. hey our dads love us but my dad if i showed up home and broke he'd tell me yeah you can go to the feed store and work my mom give me some money you know if i was hungry she'd get up at two o'clock in the morning and cook my dad say hey man water burgers open all night get your ass down and get a burger you know there's a difference there you know yeah and and it was so hard i i, I, I man i felt for her so bad because with me knowing where i was and knowing how much at peace I was, I could have stayed there. I'm serious. When I came back, I I was fighting to get back there. I would just soon stayed there. But it wasn't my time. It wasn't my day, you know. Right. So with her, I was I was glad to see her, you know, get through it. And and you never get over that. I'll be honest no. with you. You never get over losing a kid. You never do. But you get to where you can deal with it and live through it, you know. Yeah. And and she's yeah she's been man she's been she's driven a million miles in rigs she's floated credit cards when we had to you know i mean she's done it all and she took brody a million miles he was a cutter you know and rode those cutting horses and yeah. loved it and played polo cross and she did all that and i think there was just such a void there just so fast you know what i mean that it took her a long time but but i've learned i mean i've learned a lot from about four or five people in my life that were, you know, Willard Moody was one of them. You know, Willard, unbelievable amount of faith right there, you know, just can just roll through it. Carter Edmondson, you yep. know, is, is one of those guys. And Jenna was right there with him. And she's, she's pulled herself through it and pulled me through a lot with that faith. Well, and talking to about every rodeo cowboy that I talk to, it's the wife on the backside of it that, is i mean where where would you be without that i mean you may have may have been dead uh no telling where i would be you know because we've all screwed up and and major screw ups it's not minor you know just get over it it's it's screw ups and without them there to help forgive us number one but pull us through to make us a better person you know no telling where we'd be 
Well, you and I, I mean, I don't know how many you've had. I've had 15 surgeries, man. Yeah. You don't want to go to surgery by yourself. You nope. know, go to, and, and, and you don't hear what the doctors are saying at the time. You, you know, you might miss something. They're there listening, so they know what to do for us. You know, they get us to the hospital. You can't drive yourself home for most surgeries. Right. You can yeah. maybe, you know, now at the day surgeries, but still you don't feel like it. You can't take care of yourself at home. You know, she, they, I've had 15 of those, man. That's a lot. You know, yeah. you've had a handful. You've had a I've lot. I've got a nine on my them, docket. There you go. Okay, 24 times we've needed them, and not once have they left us hanging. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's why today, and I mean, we enjoy life. I, don't get me wrong, man. It took a few years to get through that when we lost Brody. It really did. I tell you, I tell you, John Douch, John Douch and Kobe, uh, probably the biggest things that moved us on that ever could have happened. We needed them as much as they needed us at the time. And I, 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 I'm so thankful that John is doing so good and on his own rolling and ripping and running. And Kobe's going into college now. He just graduated high school, you know, and, and I'm so glad they're doing good. But they were so important to us at that time. They needed our help. We, and we, unbeknownst to us, needed them probably more than they needed us. And it was just a great thing. But that got us moving on and and focusing time, money, and effort. But going back to it, guess who did everything? Jenna's the one that did all the entering for them. She's the one that made sure they got all their grades. She's the one that hired the private teacher for Kobe. She's, the, you know, on and on and on. She's the one that did everything behind the scenes for them. I helped them rope and I had gave her the money. Here, Jenna, buy this, buy that. But other than that, she did it all. She did it for them just like for me. We can't, and obviously I've known Jenna as long as I've known you and just to know yep. how sweet and great of a person she is and then to be able to pull through something so tragic like that and then go and help, you know, Colby and, and John, it, it just shows her faith and knowing they were put there to help you guys. You know, that's- Oh, 100% right, 100%. They, they, were, they, they showed up at our house to sell me a, sorry little old horse for a reason you know and and she is um you know she's very caring and she she takes care of them you know like i mean she loves them death yeah they're not ours you know we're not their mom and dad but we love them and take care of them just as much as we can like it and she's you know at the finals you know first she's wearing a john dow's t-shirt to the to the rodeo at night that bailey you know made for him and stuff and i'm like you know i know there's thousand dollar outfits in there you know but that five dollar t-shirt with john that, that was what had to be had you know yeah. it's the care and the it's the care and the love she has for them that that she had for brody the same way that has made me be as you know successful as i am i always had she always had my back again if it wasn't for for special women in our lives i mean Lindsay's the same way for me through ups downs winnings losings you know tragedies you know I would. I don't know if I'd be alive, even with my diabetes. I mean, this diabetes is something that's, that's right. been around forever. But she's always, you know, there's been times where if I didn't get a soda or a something, you know, it's, this is minimal shit. But if I didn't get took care of, she knew how to take care of me. Yes, the the, the little things like that is what what are so special, and that's why that's why I think you know it's no different. Than, it's not the same. Don't be wrong. But look at. Jake and Clay, look at Speed and Rich, look what Caleb and Junior are doing. Yeah. It's almost like a marriage. One of them shines the light on the other that makes the team bright. And yeah, it that's... and when you do it that way through the ups and downs, good and bads, and 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 all the whatever comes, look how successful you are in the end. Look how many gold buckles they have. Look how many you have. Look at your kids, how good they're doing. Look how he fell right into Texas and is enjoying it. It's all about it's that team. Well, and you, they, you know, you you hear the saying behind every good man or behind every man's a good yeah. woman. Yeah. I call bullshit on that because it, she's never been behind me. And now, now when I was younger, don't get me wrong, I was in the light and she was back there. But I sure, always thought, sure, sure. You know, and, and I and I regret a lot of that. I wish I would have pulled her up to the front with me more. But I guarantee you now, it's it's her right by my side. And and I wouldn't have been as successful as it was early on if it wasn't for her by my side. Oh yeah, and we and they, and they know that. That's the funny thing. You know what I mean? They know that, and and they're okay with it. And it's almost like that. That's that's what they do, and they've done it well for us and a lot of us.
You know, and there was, and I, I hate even thinking that this was a thought, but there was a time when I was rodeoing and married that people come up, oh, are you married? I'm like, well, how the hell do you not know I'm married? You know, and I don't know if it's happened to you, but yeah, it makes you feel about that big when she's at home supporting you from there and you're out here just, you know, being a rodeo champion. But, but that's, hey, that's in any, that's in anything that you're successful. Luke, I remember one time apologizing to Brody for being, I was gone three weeks, you know, or whatever, one after another. I never got home and I missed something. And I remember saying, man, Brody, I'm sorry. He said, hold up. Don't apologize for that. He said, are we not going to, we were going, we had a trip planned to the Dominican Republic. And it was like a week down there and, you know, and he was going to, he loved scuba diving and stuff. And he'd get to dive. And then the next year that we were going to Australia, you know, the Barrier Reef, I was doing things. He said, are we not going on this trip? I said, yeah, we're going. He says, well, why are you going to apologize to me for being gone to provide what we get to do? Hey, man, right. he said, Dad, if you were a doctor and, and you were a heart surgeon, you'd be gone if people had bad hearts because they'd need you. Right. And he said, "If he said, what about that poor mechanic you call at all hours of the night to work on your stuff? And he always does. He said, if you're good, Dad, you're busy. And I never, after that, I never regretted one thing I had to do to, do, to provide for them because it doesn't matter, Luke. Look at football. Look at, look at, look at, you know, those guys don't want to go to spring train to spring ball, the baseball right. or go to the winter league. They think, man, I'm good enough. I don't have to, but they have to do it to keep their job to be successful. Right. So, you know what I mean? It's anything you do. If you're good, listen, I got a guy that remodeled our house and built that truck and all that. I called him at 10 o'clock one night because something didn't work. And he come and fixed it. You know what I mean? Because he had put it in there. If you're good at what you do, at what you do, you're going to be busy and you're going to be gone. You can't help it. Yeah, that's there's so much, so much to that. And and like you said, Brody saying that, it just puts you at ease knowing that he understands yep. what you're doing to, to, to support him. And, you know, now I want to talk about how things have differed between now and then because for me, I get jealous. A little, maybe mm -hmm. it's just the competitor in me, but seeing what all these kids are winning now and how much they're winning. And, you know, and, and I was even, you know, before I started, you, like you said, what the rounds pay nine, 10,000 at the NFR, and now they're paying 27, which I still think they should pay at least 50, personally. Uh, I think, I think, I think every round should pay 50 and the average pay 100. I, yeah. I do too. I think there's so much money that's not getting put back into that. Don't get me wrong. I know it's a lot of money, it looks great and everything, but if you have ever been to Vegas during that time and you've ever read <laughs> exactly. reports on how much money that is spent that week, those 14 days of how much money is brought into that town, uh, there's no reason the rounds couldn't pay 50000 But with that said, I remember even the last, it was not the first couple. You know, they used to be four monies, and they'd pay 10000 yeah. to win a round. Not six monies, not eight in average. It was only four. I'm like you. I'm not. I'm, I am a little jealous, yes. Cody and I were talking the other day, and I talked to Fred about it. What we would give for three years. Yes. Just three years oh. of what they get to rope for now. The last year I made the finals, Luke, was 06. I retired in 08 after I had my hips done. My hip done. So I retired in 06. I tried it in 08. Listen, I won. I was the all-around high money winner at the finals. Or not high money. All-around, they called it back then. I wasn't the high money. I was all-around. I won 136000 I think in both events and play six, five times in the team roping and six times in the cap rope and won 136,000. They have a mediocre finals now and win 90 grand. Yeah, exactly. A mediocre. Luke, I won't even think about them. And we'll be in the ninth round. And I'll, I've been watching doing TV on every night on this search, so whoever it is. And I've been thinking, man, they've had a terrible finals. <laughs> and Jeff will throw in there, you know, well, he's got two more chances, but he's had a decent week with 75,001. And I'm yeah. like, how? How the hell did he do that? <laughs> you know? How the hell did he do that? He hadn't taken a victory lap yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly right. But yeah, and, and even up to the Amer I mean, you could throw in the American. These guys have oh, a chance oh. at a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. Houston paying a hundred thousand. Yeah, Calgary paying a hundred thousand. Never nodded in my head. I didn't get to go to Calgary. It was always fifty when I went. You know what I mean? And Houston, I mean, fifty grand. John went fifty, sixty-two thousand at Houston. One that year counts I towards won, the world standings. That counts. That counts. That's another thing. I think it's great with rodeo. And I'm going to tell you this. It's nice to be able to do. I do a lot of clinics and rope a lot of kids. It's nice to be able to tell them you can make a living rodeoing now if you'll get after it. Yeah. You know, a good living. A good living. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. like I said, I, looking at that, you know, you got the WCRAs <laughs> that are even paying as much as they are. And like, ah, like you said, three years. And what I'd like to think if we were in our prime, those three years, we could oh. damn near double, you know, double what what our career earning. Maybe not your career earnings are higher, but. I, I, I'm telling you, you're right, though. I, look, I looked at the other day and Shad had been to some jackpot. He won 39000 at it. You yeah. know, we had two big jack. Y'all didn't have but two or three. Y'all had that big jackpot in Phoenix. I can't yeah. remember that guy's Pat, name. Pat that Manley. That's right. And y'all had one other one I remember somewhere was good. But and we'd have like the Windy Run, and we had San Angelo, and maybe one other one. And then those guys now, hey man, there's about ten jackpots pay thirty, forty thousand they're open at, and I'm like, God, what would I do with that? <laughs> no. Well, and, and they're roping a lot smaller calves compared to what you guys used to rope. I, I throw that around all the time. I'm like, well, you guys bulldog smaller steers than what I got to bulldog. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but when they when they laugh and say, no, you don't, all I got to do is show them a picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Picture. Sorry, there's a reason we've had all these surgeries. We tore ourselves up on big stuff. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Well, man, Joe, I appreciate you coming on the show. And, and again, thank you for what you've done for the sport. Uh, and mainly what you've done for me in my career from getting to rodeo with you, getting to travel with you, getting to learn from you on how to speak, how to talk, how to, you know, compose myself to sponsors, to TV and, and, and everything, man. It, this is, uh, this has been fun. I, I know the fans are going to love it and, um, and we'll have to do it again. We will do it again. And I appreciate all that. It means a lot to me and I enjoyed it, but i tell you what I really enjoyed the other day. I enjoyed you down in the arena watching your boy, you know, you and Br Bray Arms down there, just just like y'all are about to run one at the finals. That's what's the fun part for me. I've always said, you know, all y'all, and I call all y'all boys, y'all are all young, young to me, you know, and I got to watch y'all come along, and, and it was fun being part of that, and now it's fun seeing you on the other side of the nickel. So gr greatly enjoyed, greatly, greatly, uh, forever be glad of our friendship and getting to go with you. I was at the end, but you were at the, fu at the front. It was fun, and... Uh, Best to you, and I'll see you when I see you, buddy. Yes, sir. Thanks, Joe.